welcome to this third edition of the Climact uh, Ideas and Action Seminar Series. So today we're very excited and uh, to, to be hosting two great speakers. And I just want to go through the introduction stuff as fast as possible so we can get to them. Um, but people are still coming in as well. So this is just as well. Um, so uh, the, the first point is that um, Climact is a joint EPFL and UNIL platform uh, center. Uh, we're going to be more and more an official center because we just got approval highlighting um, climate research and teaching and raising ambition on climate action, uh, especially in Switzerland, but hopefully across the world. And these ideas and action seminars are every, so far they've been every second Monday from 12 to one um, with two speakers on different topics, either from EPFL or the University of Lausanne or beyond. And uh, today we have two speakers from beyond, which is exciting as well. Um, and so the goal is to raise ambition and to generally go beyond what's already being done. And so far our speakers have really um, delivered on that and really helped us uh, think on these topics in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, the main logistics and conduct is please keep your video and microphone off unless you're speaking. So unless you're asking questions and if you wanna ask questions, please write them in the chat or raise your hand or speak up. The meetings are recorded and will be posted online except for the discussion part. So the question part is not included. Um, and normally they're bilingual in English and French, but today is purely in English. However, if you have a question in French, that you would rather speak and ask in French, please ask it and we'll be happy to translate. Um, so, so far we've had uh, two seminars that were very interesting with Adal Toron, Evelina Trutvenite, Trutnevite, Nelly Niwa and Julia Schmale, and they are all um, uh, available on YouTube if you would like to catch up and see them, they're really interesting. Uh, so today we're going to hear from Piers Forster, who's one of my former um, dear colleagues at the University of Leeds, a professor of climate physics who's been involved in every single aspect of climate life in the UK and internationally. And he's going to be talking about decarbonizing a country with climate science, can it be done? And after we will have uh, Professor Céline Givars, uh, who uh, is a lead author in the IPCC Working Group 3, as well as Professor of Economics and Climate Mitigation at École des Bois in Paris. Uh, and the question is how or can economic research contribute to the mitigation agenda? And with that, I will hand over to uh, Piers. So I will stop sharing the screen and Piers, uh, it is um, your turn to go. Okay, and it's, ex it's excellent to be here today. Bonjour to the monde. Uh, I will speak in English and I apologize that I can't to you in French today. I'll just put up my PowerPoint slide. Um, yeah, okay, so, so I wanted to talk about the role of climate science, and I thought I'll begin by sharing this diagram. The, this diagram does nicely sum up basically all of working group one IPCC climate science with one, di with one diagram. And what it indicates is that we have a good understanding that temperatures have gone up from our activities uh, uh, and we are currently at about just over one degree. Uh, and what it also indicates is can, can, can where we do go to potentially from this point. So, so, so it does indicate the sort of pathway we want to keep out of where we could end up with temperatures above four degrees if we continue to emit high levels of carbon dioxide and it also tells us that if we are able to very rapidly decarbonize we can potentially keep temperatures to well below two degrees or, or, or we uh, but, but of course that does require a lot of change in our society so 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 that 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 
picture hasn't really changed. So, uh, so, so I want to talk about what can our science contribute to really taking us on the journey to where we are today. And if you do look at current climate actions, we'll probably end up with temperatures um, somewhere above 2.8, 2.9 degrees, perhaps, if you look at policies from around the world. But so you want to get to this path to onto the kind of, kind of onto the well below two degrees path. And I thought I would tell you about the priestly center. So uh, I established with the help of colleagues this center, the university leads to work at, to work on climate solutions. Uh, and it's interesting in fact, the priest himself was this scientific philosopher uh, and him and his kind of colleagues were, were, were really into the business of transforming and changing their society. Uh, and in in the 1790s, there was kind of riots were when the conservative population were really concerned about their ideas uh, and, and they tried to kill them and they tried to burn their house. Town, much like the riots in the capital at the, at the weekend, but but the fortunate thing is they weren't very intelligent, so they actually burnt down the incorrect building. So 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 Joseph Priestley and his colleagues survived, and they went to trial their ambitions in other countries. But, but I think this just, this does indicate the role of scientists in potentially changing their society. Uh, uh, and, and I thought about who would be the scientists today that are, that are really actively trying to change our society. And I did immediately think of Julia, but, but because she, this, this is where she is the demonstration and she's putting up one of her scientific diagrams. So, so she's trying to actively, trying to, trying to use her scientific understanding to change our society. Uh, and she says also that we as scientists have to really change. So I want to talk about that today. Um, and I've been essentially involved in these IPCC reports through time since the 2001 report, my first one, and then I've been involved in all of them since that time. Uh, uh, and they're pretty thick, dull, conservative documents, but they've, I think they have, they have, they have done a pretty good job of really trying to, get the international community together and to try and get the politicians to regularly come together in the UNFCCC negotiations where they are a trusted source of inform inform information by a lot of different countries. But, but they have been accused of being a bit conservative and repetitive, uh, uh, and they don't really change through time. If you look at the conclusion, they haven't changed, and they're also very kind of technical. So, so I've been working a bit from Tider to try and make these reports as progressive as can possible, uh, uh, and and I think we particularly had some success some success in doing this in the special report on 1.5 degrees. And this was a report that, that went right from the issues right through 
to the applied solutions. Uh, 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 and I think by going from end to end to end and being far more focused than the more comprehensive report, it really did a good job uh, directly in going into national policy. So, so the UK and France, for example, and now a lot of the country directly took the finding from the reports and passed them into their net zero legislations. Um, I just wanted to tell you one interesting bit, interesting scientific result, and this to do with this thing I worked on called the remaining carbon budget. And this is the amount of carbon dioxide we can emit as a society if we want to keep temperatures below one and a half degrees or two degrees and things. Uh, and it's quite a complex technical bit of work that I'm certain with a lot of uncertainties. And it, it, in, in the IPCC report, we presented a lot of different analysis on it, but we try to just get people to not think about this many carbon budget to much and to more concentrate on the sort of actions society would have to take to get to net zero by a particular time to keep temperatures below one and a half degrees or two degrees. So, so, so we turned it from just this is where we are to this is what we want to do to change. But in fact, interesting. So, so, so we thought that the idea of the net zero time would be more interesting, but in fact, it's interesting that people like Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion have kind of become quite fixated on this on this remaining carbon budget idea. So, so in one of her talks, he explicitly referred to it right at the beginning. Uh, uh, and, and I and I just think that this quite active idea can circulate in that, oh, we only got five or 10 years to go or 10 years or 12 years to go. Uh, uh, and the, this, and they're taking this carbon budget calculation as a sort of countdown to doomsday kind of approach to try and affect change. And I really don't necessarily think it's the best way of getting society to change. So it'd be good to talk about that. Uh, um, okay, so I. For the rest of my for the rest of my, rest of my talk, I want to talk about my job for the UK Committee on Climate Change. So, 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 so this UK committee has been going for quite a long time. It was started by an act of parliament, and we offer independent advice to government on their greenhouse gas reductions. And pretty interesting is the, the government either have to take up recommendations or they have to explain to the rest of the country why they are not. So, so I think this committee has been particularly su successful at getting the UK to pursue a decarbonisation agenda. So, and it's quite, uh, and and the and the way that we work is to produce the once more quite dull technical report to to government uh, uh, and we just published one in December on the sixth carbon project and pathway uh, and what we set out in this report were was a 
potential pathway to decarbonize the UK economy. Uh, uh, and I and we can go through the details interested afterwards, but I just indicate one particular thing, and that that is really what we what we say in the report about the way we want people to change their behaviours, and um, which is the which is the very first bit of the decarbonisation grid. And 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 really, when it comes to trying to change behaviour and change society, I think we as a committee are very conservative. So, and that is because we really don't feel it is our job as scientists and committee members to to really try and dig 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 take the way the people should change. So that is a bigger conversation for society. So, so we aren't putting too much emphasis on new changes. Uh, um, and this gets to the very last slide I thought I put up, uh, um, which is thinking about the way we as scientists should be communi communicating. Uh, 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 and and this is a picture also from America, of course, and it does does show Donald Trump giving one of his briefings about the coronavirus pandemic, and 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 he is he is he is he is surrounded by two or three academics that are explaining the science uh, and this scene is exactly like the one that we have in the uk we have scenes of Boris johnson with academics on either side and i think the scene repeated in nearly every country uh, and it's interesting because in these briefings about coronavirus these academics are being used, they're being very used politically. So, but, but, so, so they have to walk this type basically. They have to think about, is it really worth me being used politically? because I have so much information I want to explain. So perhaps they can put up with being used as a political tool, but, but it, it does also put them in real risk, perhaps, of, of using their credibility with the general public uh, uh, and they're trying to explain some scientific facts that are very uncertain at the same time so they're trying to convey uncertainty they're trying to keep their integrity uh, and they're to trying to not get too politicized uh, and I do think they pretty much have done a brilliant job so so it's I think we have a very hard role as scientists in fact to really try and give society the inf information to change but, but I think it's not necessarily up to us to dictate the way society ought to change. Okay that's the end of my talk so I will very much look forward to the discussion and thank you for your time. Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you and to talk about uh, climate change. Um, I'm actually an engineer and an economist, and so I'll, I'll talk more um, um, precisely about uh, what can uh, maybe economics do um, for uh, climate change mitigation. So uh, let me first try to share my screen. 
Okay. Is that working? Yes. Okay, I'll take that for you. Um, so what can uh, economic research contribute to the mitigation agenda? It, it seems like a topic we could discuss for hours or maybe days even, uh, but I, I'll try my best to keep it to uh, 15 minutes uh, for now. And um, what I will try to do if I manage, yeah. So I, I'll try to, um, to say three things. First, um, I'm very sorry to say it, but uh, I think economists have failed us to a large extent. And I measure the schizophrenia in the statement as I'm both, both in the economists in the sentence, but also uh, in the us as a human being uh, as well. Um, then I'll try to show you that not economy and that there are interesting studies out there and a lot of hope from the recent and upcoming ones. And finally, I'll give a few ideas about what sort of studies I think we, we need more because I understood that the seminar was a lot uh, about what there is to do from now on and a bit less on, on past um, studies. Um, so of course, uh, things are changing. But until very recently, the economic discipline has not considered climate change as an important topic to work on. And for instance, uh, this is a, um, um, a blog by Oswald and, and Stern, who showed that only a, a ridiculously small percent of articles uh, address climate change from the huge number of articles published in the nine journals that are considered by the profession as top journals. Compared to the importance of climate change for our societies and economies, that's very, very few. But maybe the issue lies also with what is considered as top journals or this whole idea of top journals uh, altogether. Um, so I wondered, on, on what uh, could my fellow economists be working if not on climate change? I, I was really puzzled. So I looked at the general categories from the Journal of Economic Literature that are uh, broadly used uh, in economics to classify the, the topics of research. And you see uh, the list of, of general categories uh, here on the slide. And in fact, I do not see a single of those general categories of economic studies that doesn't have a link, a strong link with climate change. For example, for macroeconomics, it's a big question to look how macroeconomic stability and financial stability can be ensured while completely transforming the structure of our economies to climate neutrality. Same for finance where we need to look at what it applies to have massive investment in renewable energy, for instance, and massive divestment from fossil fuels, et cetera, and et cetera. I could talk about health uh, systems and how they work in, in a changing climate. I could look at labor, education, or have very strong links with climate change. In fact, there's one category where climate change economics is classified. This is this Q1, the agricultural and natural resource economics, environmental and ecological economics. But I think it's precisely the issue to think in silo and leave it to specialists when in fact the topic is so systemic and touches all activities. And here I see a parallel with, with what I see from my work in the High Council on, on Climate in France, which is the sister institution to the Climate Change Committee in, in the UK. And what we see is that until very recently, and things are changing, but, but part of the difficulty to have climate action consistently match the level of ambition that is required, I think it's because it's still mainly left to the Ministry of Environment and to climate laws. 
instead of having all ministries and all laws and decisions actually act for um, climate mitigation. And even in the climate economics part, some works of the past have been extremely influential with a message that was basically, don't worry, climate change is not a big deal, only a few percent damage to our economies that will grow anyway. Uh, and so only moderate action is needed. And for instance, on my slide, um, you see uh, from uh, Bill Nordhaus novel lecture that his work finds that it would be economically optimal to target an increase in global temperature of about 3.5 degree at the end of this century. And he got the Nobel uh, Prize in economics for that just two years ago. And almost the same day, the IPCC special report on 1.5 was released with quite a different message. But don't get me wrong. Uh, what I just said, I think, is only a caricature of economics and economists. And research in climate change economics is far from this straw man economist of the past and a lot more subtle and interesting, I think. For instance, and, and precisely building on Bill Nordhaus work, uh, some emerging studies accounting for empirical estimates of damages, accounting for risk, for consistent discounting, for distributional consideration, suggest that pathways that stabilize global temperature below two degrees are likely to be economically optimal at the global level. And I give you some references of such studies here. And there's also hope coming from the younger generation. In an economics uh, teaching program called CORE, they have asked throughout the world to students in economic departments the same question. What is the most pressing issue economists today should be addressing? And what I find fascinating is that the answers are extraordinarily similar, no matter the country. I couldn't find the answers for Switzerland or for France, but you have here the answers from students in Colombia and students in the UK. And you see that sustainability or the environment or global warming come as a top priority, but not as a top one. And inequality is the main one. And I think this is because we are actually in a double crisis a climate crisis or sustainability crisis more broadly, but also an acute and deepening inequality crisis. And in fact, there are many ways in which climate change and inequality are intertwined. First, rich countries and individuals have contributed and continue to contribute disproportionately to climate change. For instance, in France, the average carbon footprint of the first decile, the 10% richest household, is three times higher than the average carbon footprint of the 10% poorer. And it's the same everywhere in the world, or even worse than in France. And conversely, individuals are more exposed and more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. This is not to say that rich countries or individuals are not exposed, but that the distribution of climate change disproportionately affects the poorest. And finally, action to mitigate and adapt to climate change can either exacerbate or reduce inequalities. My first two points here, they are facts. They are already well established, but some further work is still necessary to continue to document that double inequity. And for those of you who read French, here is a reference of a survey of the literature on climate change and global inequality that we did with my colleague Nicolas Taconet. And now the third point, actually, it's not a fact. It actually depends on how policies and actions are designed and implemented. And that's where uh, 
it depends on our collective choices. And I think that's why it's the most important and we need more studies to understand how policies and action can be implemented to respond to that double crisis of inequality and uh, climate change. And this is uh, a study with Nicolas Taconnet and, and Aurélie Méjean, where we, we've tried to quantify the influence of climate change impacts and mitigation costs on inequality between countries. And you probably know that over the recent decades, inequality between countries has fallen, increased within countries. But what we find with this research is that climate change could actually reverse this trend and there could be, there will be a rise in inequality between countries in the course of this century. And what we find is that mitigation of climate change is key to limit future inequality because the lower emission pathways show lower inequality levels. levels. So now, uh, uh, I want to share a few ideas where I think more research is needed. Uh, and I base these ideas on my recent efforts to try and, and assess and summarize uh, current knowledge on economic implication of mitigation pathways compatible with long-term goals. But I'm leading for an IPCC working group three uh, on mitigation chapter for the upcoming uh, sixth assessment report. First, um, I think we need to shift a little the focus and the communication from studying and quantifying mitigation costs to make emission benefits along mitigation pathways more visible. Benefits coming from avoided impacts from climate change, but also co-benefits of mitigation action that also improves along other dimensions, for instance, health benefits from air quality improvements. Then, and linked to what I said about inequality, we need to look beyond aggregated effects and study distributional issues to understand who benefits and bears the cost of mitigation and how to design mitigation policies and action to reduce inequality and poverty. We also need to change what we quantify and measure because ultimately it influences what is valued. We know GDP is character of value. And yet GDP and growth are very much dominant in defining public policies, influencing businesses and shaping imaginaries. It's also still the dominant indicators in studies on economic implications of mitigation pathways and mitigation policies. So we need more research and action connecting well-being to sustainability in a consistent framework highlighting their complementarity and developing well-being indicators using them in research for so all levels of governance. And finally, because we are in times of action, the balance between ex ante simulation and ex post analysis, maybe I should say not really ex post, but rather during the vaccine analysis, has to understand what is effective and what is not, why, and also what are the distributive effects of implemented policies. There are already many studies uh, on those four aspects, but uh, we need more, I think. And so I'll finish here uh, and would be uh, extremely happy to exchange ideas on those topics with you. Thanks, Celine. And I, it's um, thanks for your, your provocative uh, talk. And um, I think it's been very uh, just for information, uh, Celine and I are working on the, um, the same chapter in working group three of the IPCC, and it's been um, an interesting process to try to put